Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, PBM, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Marks Paneth, Capital One Bank. Additional funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, Bank of America, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kesmatidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, People's United Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, and these friends. I'm very fortunate to have an individual who is the Dean of the Sysim School of Business of Yeshiva University, an individual who has dedicated his career to educating people, and his name is Noam Wasserman. Thanks for being here, Noam. Thank you, Michael, and uh, not just for having me, but also for everything you do for the community and uh, also for the university. So thank you for your dedication to our next generation. So tell me about a little bit about your grandparents and then your parents and then on your life. Sure, so my grandparents, three quarters of them came from Poland. Uh, the one quarter of them came from, of all places, Boston, which is where I am right now. Um, the Boston one, uh, Dora Kahn, who married my grandfather, Rabbi Moshe Wasserman. Um, she was a violinist in the Boston Symphony, so a little bit of the planting of the seeds of some of the music within the family. Um, uh, then in terms of my parents, they both grew up in Brooklyn, uh, met in camp as color war generals. Uh, they were each dating other people, and they uh, they had a policy of not putting uh, couples together as generals, and so they got split up and got put together, and uh, the rest was history. They got married when they were 19 and 21, so nice and early. Uh, my mother was a high school English teacher initially in uh, some tough neighborhoods, uh, lots of stories that she tells about that. Uh, later became a CPA, uh, so being able to go and hit on both sides of her brain, uh, being able to go and tap that. Uh, my father originally went to Yeshiva University then went to uh, dental school in DC, he went to Howard University. Uh, while, uh, right before his graduation, uh, while he was in school, I was born. Um, he then went into the army, this is during the Vietnam era, and he did his oral surgery residency there, um, and then ended up becoming an orthodontist. Um, while they were in the army, they took a trip out to LA, happened to love it, uh, and ended up moving out to there when I was three. And my father uh, created a booming practice that he uh, had there for more than four decades. And uh, my mother very involved in lots of things there, including getting the CPA and uh, working as an accountant for a while and also helping all of us children within the family. I was the oldest of four. Well, you've been the professor at Harvard. You've been at Stanford professor. So let's talk about when you moved out to California. Mm -hmm. You were three years of age, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so moved out to there, very idyllic growing up out there. Um, the, Every day, the same weather, um, lots of great resources there in terms of on the uh, Jewish side, some of the great schools there that uh, we went to, um, some key building blocks for me. Um, I actually began life as an engineer and some of the seeds for that were planted by uh, my father in terms of the, uh, the activities that in a very understated way he went and got us involved in. Uh, I remember still uh, after one day, it was a Sunday that we had gone and uh, we're playing intramural football. This is when I was in seventh grade. Um, on the way back from it, we stopped at a place. My father took us to a place that uh, had, I think, like a tent in a backyard or something that turns out to have had a whole bunch of computers there. And he put down, I think, $1,200 and bought an Apple II Plus, uh, brought it home, and it just sat there for a year um, until I was sick one day in eighth grade and happened to pick up the manual from it, start reading through it, and that became my life for the next five years. Uh, and so uh, a little bit of the implicit planting of a seed that 
uh, my parents had done that then became a key part of everything that I've done since then. So I uh, began life as an engineer, computer programming in high school. When I would get bored in class, my wind would wander and I would be, do programming in my head. Um, uh, several of the other activities that I had, the science fair that I uh, created a simulation of the, uh, the solar system uh, to go and do graphically. Like everything, every excuse that I could have was uh, going and doing that. You wanted to move very fast. You wanted to graduate high school at 16. You wanted to graduate college. Tell me about the story of the rabbi saying to you, slow down, okay, which had a major effect on your life. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you're exactly right about my mindset at that point was to rush through life. Um, I don't know where the goal came from, but to go and finish college by 19, uh, go and finish, you know, three years after finishing high school. And it was still April, almost exactly this time of my senior year. I was all set to be going to college and I got a summons to the principal's office. Um, Rabbi Shalom Tendler wanted to see me and it was usually good news when he wanted to go and see me. I wasn't sure what this was about, um, but he sat me down and he said, yes, I know that you wanna to go to college, but you're gonna to go to Israel first for a year. Yeshiva will be a good experience for you. Here's the one that I think you should be going to. And while I was there, I got a chance to go and reflect, got a chance to go and you know, put up the periscope, survey the landscape and take the nose away from the grindstone like it had been throughout high school. And at that point, I realized that it's far more important to go and do things right than to do things fast. And that has shaped almost everything that I've done since then, that key lesson, uh, the insight that came from being able to go and reflect on the pace that I was doing things and the quality that I was going and doing things with. And that three years to graduate goal turned into six years between the end of high school and doing the one year in Israel. And then what I did in college, we can get into that a little bit if you want around um, coming in as an engineer, but then adding on something to it uh, to be able to go and do that took five years. And so uh, doubling the three year plan of it being six years between the two. But then since then, everything that I've done of being able to go and have it rise to the level of excellence, uh, not have it be that we're rushing into it and instead going and setting the table and building a foundation for everything that comes after that. Now, how do you decide that you wanted to go to the University of Pennsylvania? What brought you to Philadelphia? Uh, we actually got a call from uh, someone on campus. Penn had an honors program called the Benjamin Franklin Scholars Program. And he was a member of BFS. He was in the program. And each year he would just go and take the list of the students admitted to BFS. And he would scan it for Jewish names or for Jewish high schools because he was very interested in going and growing the, the campus presence, being able to go and have a minion on campus, like 10 uh, people who could go and come together for prayers, being able to go and have strong Jewish learning on campus. Uh, his name was Danny Eisenberg, uh, went on to become a major force within the medical field and Jewish ethics and medical ethics and things like that. Uh, but it was the phone call from Danny that I got and he invited us, me and my father, to come out to see the campus. Um, and so we went out and loved the overall beginnings that he was helping go and build along with several other movers and shakers who were early there. Also loved the overall feel that I was starting to get for the culture there, be able to go and bring together multiple things to form a more powerful whole than if you're going and just focusing like a laser on a single thing. And so overall, like in terms of the being able to get to the Northeast, being able to go and be on campus there, being able to be part of the Penn culture and being able to help build a Jewish community was uh, were the major things that attracted me to there. And when you were at Penn, you met your wife, but not at Penn. How did you meet your wife? Uh, well, we actually encountered each other first at Penn. She had come and visited an old high school friend of hers there. Uh, the main way that uh, we came together, um, at that time, a whole bunch of the young collegians in the Jewish world uh, would go and uh, come to Columbia for one of the Jewish holidays for, uh, for Simchas Torah. And so I went with my roommate up to there. Um, <clears throat> he was an old uh, high school classmate of hers. And so she arranged all of the uh, arranging for us where we would sleep, the meals and other things like that. And so that's where I really got to know her was when I came up to Columbia where she was a student. Uh, by the end of that holiday, uh, we were going out and ended up going out for two and a half years. And um, she ended up becoming a pre-med student and we actually got engaged and she moved to Philly uh, the night before she started med school um, in Philadelphia. And so a pretty uh, formative, uh, that holiday, our, my going to New York was uh, the key thing of helping me find my life, the, the founding partner in life. Well, when we were talking last week, there was a discussion about the rocket scientist. Tell me about the rocket scientist. So this goes back to like my beginnings as an engineer. Um, when I was in college, I worked for three summers. My first real uh, engineering position um, was at the Aerospace Corporation. 
And so almost a literal rocket scientist, um, help me understand also in addition to like the technology and how big systems are built, how all the technology coalesces and how teams start being uh, able to go and build it was the organizational side of it. Understanding the dynamics around being able to go and work with people, being able to go and have multiple parts of the organization coalesce their efforts as they're going and doing it. Um, and so there was the engineering and also a bit of the business side um, that was coming together for me of understanding the human dynamics and um, everything else that goes into an institution and building it. You know, somebody would say, you know, McKenzie, Bain, all of these companies. You had an interview with McKenzie. I think it's something that people would love to hear about. When I got to Penn, I mentioned like the, the culture there of finding multiple things to go and do. To me, the given was the engineering side, but I started going and dating a couple of other options. Um, one of those options was going and bringing together computer engineering and also psychology. Um, and that would have been like the beginnings of what it would have become a, an artificial intelligence program and uh, things in the machine learning realm. I also went and dated a combination program called the Management of Technology program there. That was bringing together business and engineering and loved that combination and ended up going and uh, dual degreeing in that, uh, going to Wharton, being able to go and uh, take all of the business stuff for what I could there. I ended up double concentrating in that in corporate finance and also strategic management, um, in addition to going and doing the computer science and engineering side of it. When I was going and coming onto the job market, I wanted to go and find uh, something that could go and enable me to keep doing both of those. Uh, not just going to have to focus on one of them, but be able to go and have the, the greater whole, bringing those two together. Um, but on the way to going and exploring that, we also had whispering in our ear, there was the ultimate on campus is getting the McKinsey job. Uh, the, the top management consulting firm, the strategy consulting firm in the world. And so I went, dropped my resume for McKinsey and got an interview out of that and walked into that interview room um, very consciously, I'd made some decisions when it came uh, to preparing for that interview. One, I was wearing my wedding ring. Uh, I'd been already married for, uh, for more than a year um, uh, and decided to go and keep that on. Um, I was wearing my yarmulke. To, to, that's a key part of me, uh, very much you know, an intrinsic part of uh, my practice, my identity, my daily life. Um, and also wasn't bashful about like the stage of life in terms of the family. Uh, mentioned that, you know, I, I was going to have a three month old at graduation um, that I would love to be able to go and work for McKinsey. I thought that I was, I'd been well prepared at Penn to go and do. Um, and the McKinsey partner just looked right at me. And there's only like about five minutes into the interview or so that uh, we're getting into this. Um, and he said, I don't think we're for you. Uh, the consulting is not for you. Uh, you're going to have to travel a whole bunch. You're going to have to have all demands on your time that you're gonna not going to be able to go and control. And so my McKinsey interview ended up being my shortest interview ever. Let's talk about AMS. What happened there? Uh, sure. So AMS is what I ended up finding um, in terms of the, the bringing together of the business and the technology. Um, the, the, the interesting, like the business unit I was going into, I was coming out of the management technology program, and I found a business unit within there that was called the management sciences and technology unit there that would enable me to keep mating those two. Instead of just being front end consulting, um, AMS was full life cycle consulting where you would go in, you would go and understand the strategy, the goals, you might go and redesign a business process and do a whole bunch of the front end understanding of the business and how you might be able to go and bring some operations knowledge to it to go and redesign it. But then it wasn't that you would hand them the design and then it would be up to them to go and implement it. You would have to go and implement it. You would go and design the system, you would go and do the systems integration, you might do the programming and everything else that uh, would be required for it. You would deploy the system and be able to support the users. And so I loved the idea first of being able to go and get that kind of feedback loop on how well did we do the business side and how did we go and bring it together with the technology side. But I also loved the entrepreneurial culture at AMS. Um, as it turns out, as I got to know it a little bit better, Turns out it wasn't like a one single cohesive firm. It was far more a whole bunch of small business units that were brought together under, under an umbrella where each of those business units was founded by someone. Each of those was someone who saw an opportunity in the marketplace and they were able to go and pursue it and AMS would go and give them the, the reins and the support to be able to go and see, is it an opportunity and um, be able to go and have it grow into something. And so I love that combination of being able to go and bring together the disparate skills, the business and technology and be able to go and do it in an entrepreneurial realm. Um, and so that was very much the attraction that I had to AMS. It was 
far less known. It was almost a no name, almost literally, like the name doesn't stick in anyone's mind. It's such a plain vanilla name, American Management Systems. Uh, but it turns out that it was a, a very formative company for me to be able to go to. It was a major hirer out of the M&T program because it brought together the business and technology in such a, in such a great way. Um, and so that's where I went and ended up like a, initially thinking I was going to go and just do a couple of years and then think about maybe going back for my MBA. Um, but in the end, uh, because of my wife's career, she had gone to med school and she was going to be going and doing residency. I actually had to go and uh, spend five years uh, working before I went and uh, headed back to school. Um, and that was the greatest blessing. It was a great example of uh, the, the Jewish phrase about Gamzula Tova, about how it turns out to be that the unexpected turns into a blessing, um, that uh, I was able to do some major things at AMS, being able to go and found a practice there, being able to go and grow it to 19 people, being able to go and get some real leadership experience, some entrepreneurial experience under my belt there. Um, and so that very much the case of as you're going and managing the, the dual career issues and being able to go and see you have a goal, but be opportunistic also very much that entrepreneurial mindset um, and being able to go and make the most of the unexpected. Uh, that's what AMS was enabling for me before I went back to school. So let's talk about school as a student and then we'll talk about school as, an, uh, as a professor. Having gone to Wharton, like one of the best business schools, uh, very formative for me, um, I was told that Wharton, don't come back to here for MBA. Go to somewhere that's going to be very different for you. And my natural mode of learning also is to go and absorb, not to go and throw myself into a dialogue, not to go and engage, but to go and watch and be able to go and absorb that information. And so what I thought was going to be best for me was to go to a place that was radically different from that. They would go and force me to go and get out of my shell, be able to go and uh, get into the dialogues and things like that. And so I targeted Harvard Business School. I went, filled out one application for MBA um, and uh, figured that if I didn't get in, then it would be better for me to continue working. Um, and it was because HBS goes and requires you half of every course. Your grade is how much did you participate? How well did you participate? Did you throw your opinions and perspectives out there for 80 really sharp people to go and pick at it, go and show you where you're wrong? And so that's where I wanted to go and be able to have that very different style and be able to go and also get a lot more things under my belt in terms of knowledge. And uh, the more that I learned, the more I knew that I had to go and learn more about it. And so I went back to there. We thought we'd come to Boston for two years. Um, those two years turned into, now we've been in Boston living here for more than 23 years. Um, that's because along the way, I came in with my own ideas of what I wanted to do, five things, what I could see coming out of MBA. Um, the first semester knocked a couple of them off the list. One of the invaluable things about doing an MBA program that helps shape uh, your knowledge of what you really want to go and do, but also it added one thing to there and then added another thing in the, the, over the summer of it. And turns out those two things that were added, the things I didn't even expect to be going and doing, were the new things that weren't even on my radar. Those two things were doing venture capital. I did that for the summer. Um, and then doing academia. And had a couple of the professors there nudge me in the direction of thinking about becoming an academic. Um, ended up walking out the MBA graduation door in the PhD orientation door. Um, and going and focusing during that PhD um, on the things I had experienced for myself as a founder and then seen in the venture capital firm of the early decisions founders make that tend to get them in trouble. And as it turns out, I'm looking for academia. What have they learned about it? What can we rigorously go and give as answers to the early decisions, especially when it comes to the people that they involve and the ways in which the teams are affected by those early decisions? And I found nothing rigorous within academia that they can go and make um, like a solid uh, answer out of. And so I figured I would have to go and create that domain found a new arena of research on what we call, ended up calling Founders Dilemmas, uh, collected a data set on 16,000 founders across the US, uh, went and created a lot of the early knowledge about founder succession and uh, the early dynamics within the team and the trade-offs that founders make. Um, and that's what became 20 years worth of the research that I was doing in that arena. In addition, you got your MS in psychology, right? Uh, and uh, there was a uh, the, the master's was, uh, was in sociology, but the, sociology. Uh, within the PhD program I was doing, the, um, the, there were three, uh, gr three arenas that I found as the critical things for me to build a foundation so I could understand the founding arena. One of them was the psychology, the other was sociology, the other was economics. And right. so we ended up, rather than being a single-minded PhD program, we ended up creating a, a multifaceted uh, PhD program that delved into all three of those are arenas. So with like five minutes left, I want to fast forward. How do you decide to write the two books? 
So I was going and doing the research on founders dilemmas for about five years or so, starting to learn some key things. When I realized that I wanted to go and bring those lessons into the classroom, be able to go and educate the next generation of founders that were coming through HBS. I, I had been a prof I was in the midst of being a professor at HBS for 13 years um, and decided to go and create my own course. I guess the entrepreneurial juices again to go and found a course. Um, and so um, went and took a whole bunch of lessons and uh, I turned it into a course that debuted in 2009 called Founders Dilemmas. I got a little frustrated with the fact that I could only go and impact about 200 of those future founders a year and decided there's tens of thousands or more of founders that are out there every year who might be able to go and benefit from these lessons. And so I converted the course, the research, the case studies um, into a book uh, that became The Founders Dilemmas and really seemed to hit a nerve very unexpectedly for an academic book. Uh, it became like the, the best selling academic book on founders ever, um, totally unexpectedly, the same way that like the course hit a nerve and uh, we were able to go and do that. Um, in terms of the second book, I actually had my second year of the course, um, a student come by, and this is where a key thing, I always used to end my courses the last day, um, taking uh, something from the Talmud, um, there was a saying that uh, I've learned a bunch from my teachers, even more from my peers, but the most from my students, and I would go and put that up and thank my students at the end of the semester for it. This is in some ways the most tangible example of that, and a student come by and say, Noam, I know you focus on founders, I know your course is all focused on founders, but I'm never going to be a founder. However, your course has already changed my marriage. And at that point, I was totally baffled by where he was coming from because that's not at all what I was going and teaching. But he opened my eyes to the fact that these human dynamics that I was going and covering in the course, the best practices around founders were applicable to this newlywed who was going and struggling with his co-founder of life. And how do we go and architect our life together? How do we split up the roles? How do we make decisions together? And he was saying that he was importing a whole bunch of the best practices into his family life. He would be walking in and talking about how to go and build the, how do we fight well muscles that we talked about within the founding team? Uh, how do we go and split up the roles in a more effective way that we'd be going and doing? And he opened my eyes to the fact that these were life issues, not entrepreneurial issues, and that we could go and be able to help uh, change people's uh, personal lives in addition to their professional lives. Well, and that I became the second of the books that I wrote, um, the Life is a Startup, where we go and take a whole bunch of the entrepreneurial mindset and apply it in all sorts of directions that people can benefit from. So from the books, you also changed it a little bit. You left Harvard, you went to Stanford teaching, then you also taught, taught at USC. What happened in 2019? So 2019, I got uh, an inquiry from Yeshiva University. Um, I, uh, the president asked if I could come and chat with him. We got to know each other a little bit back in actually 2018. Uh, I got a request, would you be any interested at all um, in the dean position of the business school, something I'd never gotten and envisioned for myself. Um, that we're going to be ramping up our search for it. Uh, would you be interested at all in throwing your hat into the arena for it? Um, and so I went along with it, got to know a bit of uh, the school, got to know um, what are the challenges and the opportunities within the business school more broadly when it comes to entrepreneurship and innovation across the university. Happened to love the idea of being able to go and have a dean level impact on the flagship Jewish university in the world. Um, loved also the culture that the president had built. He was new to the position, but he had built a very entrepreneurial culture within the dean level and with the provost of being able to go. And uh, so I came in, got to know the faculty also and the administrative team, lots of gems there, lots of people to collaborate with and uh, lots of promise and opportunity that we could go and be able to team together on. So let's talk a little bit about the family. You've been married how many years and you have eight children and tell me what they're doing. Been married now almost uh, 31 years. Um, my wife, the gem that she is, has been able to go and be a rock star in her professional life and also in her personal life, the world's best mother, but also the head of the OBGYN department at MIT, at the, the MIT Medical that they have there. Um, my, the eight kids, uh, we now have uh, four grandkids also. Um, the oldest uh, was an MIT techie. Um, she uh, went from the most religious of the Jewish uh, high schools here to MIT, and now she's uh, um, the, she works for a machine learning startup, being able to go and um, you know really uh, create the next generation of uh, uh, of great uh, products uh, with them. Um, she has four kids; they live in New York. Um, number two is uh, is finishing med school right now. Her graduation is next month. She's going to become uh, an, an ER doc. Um, she just got married uh, a few months ago. Um, number three went to YU. I, actually, uh, everyone after my oldest has been going to YU. 
Uh, we have uh, three who have graduated so far and another one who's there, another one's going to be going to there. Um, so number two, graduated from YU, went and did a master's in biomedical engineering at Penn and now is finishing med school and going on to be an ER doc. Um, number three, went to YU, did computer science and is now working for a multinational doing, uh, doing techie stuff also, just got married a year ago. Um, number four, graduated from YU. Uh, she then went to Israel and she served in the Israeli army for a year and a half and is now starting med school next year. Number five is at YU doing pre-engineering um, and, and, and the, in the women's program there. Number six, graduating high school, going to Israel for a year like all the other kids have done. Um, number seven is a 10th grader. Um, in the high school that we helped found here, that was a founding chairman of the board to go and be able to establish it here. And uh, the, the little one is the apple of my eye, uh, the, uh, the one who comes charging up to me at the end of the day to come and greet me and say, uh, welcome home and uh, and uh, be able to go and have fun with her for the rest of the night. I think the greatest news is that the Sysim School of Business of Yeshiva has you as its dean. You're a great dean, you're a great educator, and I'm happy to be part of working with you in the growth in the future. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael, for everything.